Glad you're here this morning on this Father's Day. Let's stand up together and give God our praise and worship. Put your hands together like this. We were made to thrive in Jesus Christ. with Mary Keaton as she leads us this morning.
Mighty is our God, strong, faithful. Thank you. Be seated, please. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. We're glad you're worshiping with us this morning. Today we're wrapping up our series, Made, and be sure to join us next week as we begin our series called The B-Team. As you walked in, you received a friendship card. If you would fill out the bottom half of that and then place it in the offering plate as it comes by, or if you're a first-time guest, hold on to that, and then after the service, walk down the steps to the Connections kiosk, and we'd love to put a gift in your hand as a way of saying thank you for worshiping with us. If you would please join me in welcoming Adam Prophet to the stage. Good morning, happy Sunday, and happy Father's Day. It's, uh, it's really great to be with you all today. I am the student minister here at First Christian Church, and I get to play a game with some of my friends. I'm really excited about this game. It's going to be awesome. But first, before I have them come up, uh, I was trying to think through some things this morning that were uniquely dad. Like, so I was trying to think of some dad things. And so the first one, the most glaring example I could come up with was socks with sandals. Right? That's very, very much a dad thing. And in my mind, I kind of picture like the perfect dad, like a Chevy Chase kind of character, like National Lampoon style, like we used to watch those movies as a kid. Uh, but the next thing is um, the phrase, uh, maybe we shouldn't tell mom about what just happened. Um, I thought of Waffle House and I thought of grills. My dad can still to this day can cook nothing unless it's on a grill. And he can do really great at a grill, but if you put him in the house, he'd probably burn the house down. Um, and then the last thing is competition. Right, Whether serious or funny, competition comes to mind. And so I want to invite our three families up who are going to be participating in this game. They're going to grab a table that's off to the side and bring it up. And while they're preparing for that, I'm going to tell you the prizes they can win. And then I'm going to tell you the game. Because they don't know what the game is yet. Like They don't know what they volunteered for. And so I want to keep them waiting as long as possible so they can't scheme. Um, so the first thing... The, the, the winning family will get is a mustache because we all know that some people, they just can't grow mustaches. So we're going to help them out a little bit, give them a mustache. Um, we are going to give them a baseball. Um, Babe Ruth once gave his dog a baseball that looks something like this. So it's pretty special. Um, we are going to give them uh, a really classy, elegant, quality-made plastic medal. That says winner, even though they're all winners, right? They're all winners. And then the last but not least, the most important thing, and often involved in those moments where we say, hey, don't tell mom, some duct tape. And this is nice duct tape. This is 3M duct tape. So I think they use this like on spaceships and stuff. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but friends, what we're going to be doing, and then I'm going to introduce everyone to you. You are going to be in these bags. You have toothpicks and you have marshmallows and your job in just a minute, we're going to put two minutes on the screen and you have two minutes to build the best structure that you can. Now downstairs, someone built something that could hold my car in two minutes. So there are some expectations, but let's meet these guys real quick. I'm Sean. I'm Matthew. Mike. Awesome. The Davis family. And then, oh, boys, I forgot to ask you a question. Um, what is your dad's favorite movie? Jaws. Jaws. Nice. <laughs> awesome. All right. So who do we have here? Uh, Margaret. Michael. Henry. All right, guys. So I have to ask you, what is one phrase your dad says all the time that's completely embarrassing? Uh, when you say you're hungry, he always says, um, nice to meet you. I'm Michael. <laughs> nice. I'm hungry. Nice to meet you. I'm Michael. All right. Who do we have up here? Adeline. I'm Eli. Jason. All right, guys. <laughs> Jason's like, he totally does that all the time. It's so lame. <laughs> he also wears socks with sandals, but you know, whatever. Um, okay. So I have to ask you, if your dad was an animal, what animal would your dad be? Like a big fat cat. A <laughs> big fat cat. You are in so much trouble when you're not on stage anymore. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. All right, so can I, I've got my countdown timer. All right, so now I need you to cheer them on, all right? I need you to, get, to cheer them on, pump them up, because this is a challenging task. I'm expecting a lot from them, okay? They will let me down, and you would let all of these people down. So on your mark, get set. And go.
Oh, we got some something good started here. That looks good, Sean. That's amazing. Solid, very nice. You've got a minute and a half. One minute and a half. Oh, look at this. You've got like some trust action going on. I would trust that. I'd put my car on that. You have one minute left. The pressure is building. There's so much pressure. I can't tell if they're building structures or if they're building animals, but you know, it's gonna be great. All right, guys, you've got 30 seconds left. Everybody out in the crowd, help them out, encourage them. Give them There's an igloo, makes me want to go to Alaska. That'd be really nice. <laughs> 10 seconds. Seven, six, five, four. All right, and stop. All right, so I need you all out in the, in the audience here, in the crowd, I need you all to help me. <laughs> that, that's good. I'm not going to put my car in any of those. Um, I need you all to help me decide the winner, okay, by cheering for them. So first we have the Davis family. Give them the round of applause. Good, good. Got the Hans family. And we have the Inslees. All right, I think the Hans family wins. Great job. All right, so Henry. Henry, you have to wear the mustache. You can't go, you have to wear the mustache. Put that on. And then I'm gonna give Margaret the medal and the baseball, because you're a baseball champion. And then the duct tape. All right, give it up for these guys again. So, fathers, we sincerely hope that you're celebrated well today, but I did want to take just a quick second to say that whether there's anyone who calls you mom or dad, that every single one of us here in this room can, like, could work and serve to advance the next generation. And so I want to encourage you as, you, as you leave here today, to think about who are the children around you that you could invest in, that you can influence, whether here at church in your neighborhood or through a local organization here in Johnson City. So I hope you have a great day, and uh, we'll see you later. This morning we're going to continue to worship him, learning about made, this whole series. And this is the last Sunday. Uh, today we learn about being made to be world changers. So stand, with us up, stand up with us and sing. God made us to worship him, to love each other. Sing as Jeremy leads us. Before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped down into time and wrote the story of His love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder. So that we always remember You and I were made to worship You and I were called to love You and I are forgiven and free When you and I embrace surrender When you and I choose to believe
is all a gift from God that we receive. Brought to life, we open up our eyes to see the majesty and glory of the King. He has filled our hearts with wonder. So that we always remember you and I were made to worship, you and I were called to love, you and I are forgiven and free. Yeah. When you and I embrace surrender, when you and I choose to believe, then you and I will see who we were meant to be. Even the rocks cry out, and even the heavens shout at the sound of His holy name. So let every voice sing out, and let every knee bow down. He's worthy of all our praise. You and I were made to worship. You and I were called to love. You and I. so much. Be seated, please. We are getting ready to have the opportunity to um, give our offerings during this part of our service, and Mary Keaton mentioned earlier about a connections card for you to fill out. This is a time to drop that in the offering plate as it goes by. Again, if you are a visitor, keep yours and take it down to the connections kiosk down, downstairs in the lobby, and we have a gift for you because we're so glad that you were here to be with us today. Also, if you are a guest with us, please don't feel any obligation to give um, or uh, if you would like to, that would be great. But this is just our, our time as a church body to be able to just give back to the Lord because he's blessed us so much. Uh, we have some announcements before we take up the uh, offering as well. And the first one. I want to share with you is we are having a um, food drive where we're collecting food items for Feeding America food drive. We know that over the summer, summer months that children don't always get a regular meal like they do when they're in school. And so this is an opportunity to get a brown bag that's down at the uh, outreach kiosk down below and fill that up and bring that back this week um, so we can have that as a way to minister to people in our community. Also, our next amount announcement is that we are hosting the Global Leadership Summit. It's a chance for you to come and just meet with other people in the church and to get reinvigorated and re-inspired to be a good steward of your, of your leadership skills. And it will be August 10th and 11th. And um, while you have the chance, sign up early because we have an early bird rate and the promo code for that is in your bulletin. Um, we are also going to be starting a new uh, sermon series next week called The B-Team. Um, everyone might know what it feels like maybe not to be selected first or to not be selected for the top team. And, and this is just to remind us that God uses ordinary people to be able to make great changes in the world. So he uses the B team to minister to the people in our, in our community. So um, there's a chance for you to grab an invitation that you can take and give to someone that you feel might benefit from the sermon series. 
And finally, in just a minute, we're going to watch a video of all the wonderful things that happened at Vacation Bible School. We had gad Gadgets and Gizmo VBS this past week, and uh, we have some great news to share with you. We had over 200, we had 293 kids that came and participated in our Vacation Bible School, and we made over $1,100 to give towards the International Disaster Emergency Relief Service. So we're really excited about the chance that they had to uh, to raise money to give as an offering. So we're getting ready to do our offering here in just a moment, and if you would please pray with me, I would be really grateful. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so glad that we get to have this opportunity to give back to you. I think it's easy to get busy with life and, and not really see how you intervene in our lives, how you answer our prayers, how you're with us in every step, how you provide for us. And Lord, this is our chance just to stop and think about that and give back to you. And we know, Lord, that the money that we give to this church is used for the people in this church and the people in this community. And so we know it's an outreach to the people that we love. And so we just ask, Father, that you would bless it as well. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're the reason why our hearts are beating. As we move into our time of communion, um, just meditate on these words and sing them with me.
the moment in our service where we come around the table every week and we look at the very reason that we are here all together and we absolutely look at Jesus and what he did for us and what that means for us. Romans chapter 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death that reigns in our mortal bodies. Because of Jesus, we don't have to obey that anymore. No longer, no longer are we not only not separated from the love of God, which is reckless and insane and amazing, but we are no longer separated from anything that hinders us from following him. We have the presence of God. We have the Holy Spirit of the living and active God inside of us, and he is not dormant. We have the power of God to fill us and enable us to follow Jesus wherever he takes us and to whatever end. So sing these words with me and let's rejoice in Jesus and what he's done. that you are with us, that we have access to your presence, and that we are clean, that we are the righteousness of Christ in your eyes. God, help us to remember what you have done for us as we take these emblems. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, hey church, it is great to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I am one of the pastors here. Good to be back here with you. Been gone for a couple weeks, uh, but glad to be here as we're wrapping up our Made series. Got a lot to celebrate today. Let's see. Uh, first of all, it's Father's Day, right? So happy Father's Day to you. If you are a father or if you have a father, happy Father's Day to you. Uh, we're also celebrating VBS. I know you got to see that video. Boy, we had an amazing week here in VBS. 290 some odd kids, 180 some volunteers. We only lost 25 volunteers. We lost 10 kids. So that's a great week for us. No, just kidding. Just kidding. I got a free t-shirt out of it. So that's always a good week. So really all around great week. Our kids, if you're wondering what do they learn in BBS? Well, they were studying the same topics in BBS that we've been talking about in the MAID series here uh, in the adult worship service. So we were talking about the reality that we were made by someone and made for something. Uh, one of the verses we we looked at earlier in the series was this a verse Ephesians 2:10 for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do I love this verse uh, this verse reminds us that we were made by God but it also reminds us that we were made for something that God has work for us to do, that there's, a, that there's a target, there's a trajectory for our life, there's an intended destination toward which God is calling us. And if that's true, then one of the most important things we can do in life is to make sure that we are aiming for the right target. I learned a little bit about uh, the importance of aiming at the right target when I was in Scouts. Uh, between my 8th grade and ninth grade year, uh, like I did most summers, I spent some of my summer at Scout Camp. Love Scout Camp, love Boy Scouts, it was always a great time. That year, all of my friends wanted to get the Riflery Merit Badge. I was not particularly interested in Riflery, I didn't shoot much, but whatever, they all wanted to do it, so you know, I gave in to peer pressure and I signed up just like everybody else did, right? So the week's progressing, it actually turned out to be pretty fun, you'd go up to the rifle range for about an hour and you'd spend about half the time talking about gun safety and about half the time shooting stuff and ignoring all the things you learned about gun safety. So it was a pretty good time. It was fun. But as the week progressed, a, a problem began to emerge. It was clear that there was this one requirement that all my friends were getting checked off that I was not getting checked off. Now, the details of the requirement are blurry to me, but I know it involved this test. You had to shoot five times so close together that when they took the piece of paper, they could put a quarter on top of all the shots, and they would all be within the diameter of a quarter. And I could never get anywhere close. I mean, I, I couldn't even get one shot inside the diameter of a quarter. I'm just kidding. That was obviously one shot. It was, whatever. I was a disaster, okay? So the last day of camp comes, and it's my last chance. I've got every other requirement, and I get there, and I shoot, and it is just all over the place. I mean, a silver dollar wouldn't cover. I mean, two, two $10 bills wouldn't have covered up what I did. It was a disaster, right? And so we go back, and like, whatever. I'm not going to get rifle merit badge. I had a good time. Then the next day, we're cleaning up to go home. Cleanup goes a little faster than usual. And so they announce that everyone who hasn't qualified for the Riflery Merit Badge can go back to take their shooting test one last time. So me and two or three other people who didn't know how to shoot either, we walk back up and we're like, okay, we're going to give ourselves one last time. And so he passes out the stuff and we get down and I shoot my first one and it is again a disaster. One of my shots doesn't even hit the paper. I mean, it is ridiculous. I mean, it's just, just crazy. And I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I'm now humiliating myself. I am out of here. But the guy who is the range master or whatever, he was this super encouraging guy. He comes, come on, you can do it, blah, blah. And I remember this one line he said. He said, you only have to get lucky once. So I love this. It wasn't that I was good. It wasn't that he believed in my competency. It was just that the luck might happen. So, okay. I work myself back up. I kind of throw myself down. I get there, and I don't I ignore everything he taught me. I just shoot way too fast, but I just do it. And I look, and they're all there. I mean, they are bunched so tiny. I bet you could cover them up with a dime. I have done it. And I call him over. And I say, look, I did it. Look right there. I did it. And he looks. He says, it doesn't even look like you've done anything. I said, what are you talking about? They're all there, bunched together. Go get it. Go get the paper. And he looks, and then he sees, and his whole body just says, says Ethan, you're in lane five, buddy. That's target six. I had done it. I had finally, against all odds, done it. But in my haste to get down and set up, I'd shot at the wrong 
target. Now, good news is, I don't know this guy's name, or probably they'd kick him out of scouts or something, uh, because he gave me the bear badge anyway. He said, here, give me your card. He signed off. You know, it's kind of a, I won't tell, you won't tell kind of situation. And, and I got the bear badge, but don't hand me a gun. Okay, so, but the thing is, okay, so that, that story worked out pretty well. But in life, wouldn't it be embarrassing if we spent our life succeeding, but we were aimed at the wrong target? You probably know the old phrase, climb the ladder of success, only discover it was leaning against the wrong wall, right? And that can happen to us. I mean, we know that it's at least possible for it to happen because we we meet people throughout our lives who are all aiming for different targets. And if it's true that God created us with a purpose, then, then some of those targets have to be wrong, right? I mean, you'll meet people, they're aiming for the target of wealth or they're aiming for the target of power or they're aiming for the target of family. I know a ton, I've got a tons of friends who are single adults who, who would love for the word to get out that not all of us have to aim for the target of family and you can stop asking them when they're going to start one, okay? Because they're, they're aiming for a different target and you can get over that, you know? I know some people who are aiming for the target of work and success in that arena. Interestingly, I feel like lately a popular target in, in, in people I interact with is the target of leisure. You know the old phrase, work for the weekend? Now I know people who live for vacation, that, that's the measure of their life is the opulence of their leisure. That's the target they're aiming for. And we church people, we're no different, of course, right? Church, religious stuff can just become a new target to aim for, right? You replace the workaholism of our culture with, the, you know, the, our, my target is to be in church every Sunday. My target is to be in 12 Bible studies, four of which I'm leading. My target is to be everywhere, every time, every church is open. In fact, my church isn't open off enough. I'm going to go to two or three churches just to make sure I'm being as religious as possible. God's people got the target wrong all the time. About half the time, a prophet shows up. It's not because the people were being unsuccessful. It's because they were very successful. They were just aimed at the wrong target. Micah shows up, preaching one day, says this. He says, with what shall I come before the Lord? Bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of the body, for the sin of my soul? Then Micah gives us the answer. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. He says the target isn't all that religious stuff. The target is to live in the world as an agent of justice and mercy and humility and obedience so that everywhere around you, the world blossoms and improves with every step you take. It's interesting, the prophets rarely had anything new to say. They're just saying what God said to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your descendants so that through you, everybody else gets blessed. That's the target, that through us, everybody else gets blessed. That's what God's people have always meant to be aiming for, that through us, the whole world. Isaiah shows up, same problem. God people, they're succeeding. They're just succeeding at hitting the wrong target. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? says the Lord. I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and fat of fat animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense It stinks. New moon, Sabbath, convocations. I can't stand your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts, your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. Just to be clear, in case you've forgotten, this is God talking to his people about their religion. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer lots of prayers... I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. 
Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. He says, this is the target. Again, I just can't get over the fact that Isaiah is not coming to an unsuccessful people. In fact, this is one of the most successful times in the history of the kingdom of Israel. They were just successfully hitting the wrong target. And Isaiah says, stop it. Your success in worship services, your success in your prayers, your success in your sacrifices, it does no good if you're not shooting at the target of justice and mercy and care for the orphan and defense of the oppressed. We get confused like this too, don't we? thinking that our target is somehow identified and defined in the performance of religious ceremony. The title of this sermon is rather ostentatious. After we talked about you were made by God and you were made to follow God and you were made to be missionaries, this sermon is entitled, You Were Made to Change the World. You Were Made to be World Changers. I know it sounds sort of ridiculous to say that, but I think it's exactly what the prophets kept showing up to tell the people. You weren't made to be some new religious group. You were made to make the world around you more just and beautiful and right, to make the oppressed less oppressed and the poor less poor and the hungry less hungry. God saved us, as we said a couple weeks ago, not just from something, God saved us for something. Speaking of God saving, Isaiah goes on. He says this, Come now, let's settle this matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Part of why I love Isaiah so much is he can't go for five minutes without stopping to remind us of God's grace. So I just want to say, if, you, if you're realizing that you're living your life off target, that you've been succeeding, but you just haven't been aiming at blessing the world, then God's message to you is, I got that. I can forgive that. I've got grace for that. I can wash that clean. I can save that. No matter how selfish and self-centered and self-destructive your life has been, God's first move is to say, oh, I can save that. I can save you from yourself. And then he says, and I can save you for the purposes for which I made you. God can save you so much. He doesn't just save you from your self-destruction. He can save you much, so much that he can save you for the purposes for which you were first made. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know you were living for the purpose for which you were made? the purpose of blessing, enriching, and sustaining the world. I love this one time. Uh, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's got uh, a little bit of nagging doubt about whether Jesus really is the Messiah. So he sends messengers. Uh, the messengers come to Jesus, and they say, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replies and says, well, go back. Tell John what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Do you notice how unreligious that answer is? He doesn't quote scripture he doesn't try to prove anything from the Bible. He doesn't talk about religion at all. He just says, look, I'm living my life exactly on the target that God's prophets always talked about. I'm living my life with everything God has given me being poured out for the blessing of all those around me. Everybody I meet gets blessed, he says, unless they reject me. This church, this is what we were made to do. 
Our mandate with the gifts God has given us is not just to celebrate them or hoard them or hold the worship service about them, but to leverage those gifts so that we might be constant agents, agents of blessing and goodness and repair and rescue and justice in the world around you. People sometimes critique the church and they say that the church is irrelevant. Some part of me wants to rise up and tell them they're wrong. But I don't think I could succeed. Because here's the thing. If the church lives for the church, well, then they're right. We are irrelevant. And if the church lives to be agents of blessing in the world, then I won't have to prove them wrong. Because they'll see it when the world is transformed by the power of the gospel. I've got a story that I just love. It's an odd little story. It's from the book of Acts. But I don't know any story that more clearly demonstrates how a church that's on fire for the mission of Christ could actually change their society. It's from Acts chapter 19. It's about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And what I, I'm going to read the text to you. It's a whole bunch of text. I'll skip a little bit just to save time. But it's a long text. But what I want you to notice and watch for is how the very economics of the, of the region they live in is changed through the ministry of the church. Check this out. It's Acts uh, chapter 19. I'll start in verse 1. Like I say, I'll skip a little bit for the sake of time, but you'll get most of the story. Uh, while Apollos, uh, another preacher and apostle, uh, was ministering in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior, the interior of what's now called Turkey, and arrived at the city of Ephesus. Paul entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe, and they publicly maligned the way. That's what the early Christian movement was called, the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, and they went a couple blocks down the street and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Uh, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. Their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. About that time, about two years into Paul's ministry, uh, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers of related trades, and he said, You know, my friends... We receive good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. Practically the whole province of Asia. He says that the gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There's a danger. Not only to our trade that will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious. They began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even if some of the officials from the province, uh, friends of Paul, they sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Aristarchus, pushed Alexander rather, to the front. They shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis! The city clerk quieted the crowd. He said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down, not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. And if then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the, the courts are open, there are proconsuls, they can bring charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're being in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he said this, 
he dismissed the assembly. Now I get it. You might be wondering, why is this story so amazing? There are other stories in the book of Acts that end with dramatic shipwrecks or they end with people rescued by angels. There are stories that end with thousands being baptized. This story ends with a lawyer standing up and telling everybody to calm down and go home. I'm not even sure why this is in the Bible, right? But it isn't how this story ends that captures my imagination. It's how the story begins. It begins with the simple church of Ephesus. What, what did they do? Well, they had public worship services in a building downtown, sort of like we do. They would caught the attention of local officials. They'd become friends with some people in local government. Well, some of you have done that. They took the gospel throughout the whole region of Asia. Asia was a Roman province then, about half, uh, the, kind of the, the western half of modern-day Turkey. They took the gospel through the whole region. And they'd done this. They had converted so many people to the way of Christ that the bottom dropped out on the silver market and craftsmen had to go looking for work. In the early chapters of Acts, we tell, the Bible tells stories of 3,000 being saved, 5,000 being saved. Imagine for yourself just how many people would have had to have come to Christ in the single most populous province of Turkey for the bottom to drop out on the silver statue market. We're not talking about 3,000 or 5,000. We have to be talking about hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people that have come to Christ in this region in this short period of time for Demetrius to be able to start a riot saying, what are we going to do? Nobody will buy our little statues anymore. And today you can go to Ephesus and visit the ruin of all these places. You can even buy a little Artemis statue. But you'd be hard-pressed to find people worshiping Artemis in Ephesus today. And yet billions upon billions all over the world worship Christ. I don't know how we're going to change all the things about the world that need changing. I don't reckon it's really my job to know how. I think it's just my job to use the gifts I've been given to change what I can so that in every way I've been blessed, I might bless others. And at least that time, on that day in Ephesus, this tiny little church brought so many people to Christ that they changed the very economy of their world. That's what we get to do. I think for some of us, the biggest risk we face in life is that we would succeed while aimed at the wrong target. This room is just filled with successful people and people who will one day be successful. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think I could stop you from being successful. That isn't your risk. The, the risk you face is not that you'll fail. The risk is that you will succeed, but you will have aimed at silver statues like Demetrius rather than the gospel like Paul. Don't fall into the trap that thinking you were made to get rich or made to take vacations or made to collect power. Don't even fall into the religious trap and think God made you to go to church or made you to be in a Bible study. Those things are great. But they're great because they teach us what we were made for and empower us for what we were made for. They equip you for what we were made for. The little thing on the radio I listened to, it's a tiny little thing. They were talking about this survey they'd done about people's emotional state after a day at an amusement park or a day working on a service project. And what they discovered was the people who spent the day at the amusement park were on average more depressed than usual. And the people who, the, who spent the day at a service project were on average happier than usual. It was kind of a quirky little human interest story. But I, I guess it didn't seem surprising to me at all because the people who spent the day on the service project spent the day doing what God made them to do. And I, I love amusement parks. Go to amusement parks. But just don't think God made you for amusement parks. God made you as an agent of blessing to the world. I would just beg you, as we wrap up this made series, as you reflect on the truth that you were made by God to follow God, to be a missionary of God, that you would, you would risk this question of God. 
Oh, dear Lord, who do you want me to bless? Oh, dear Lord, how do you want me to make the world a better place? Where do you want me to bring justice and peace? Were you made to rescue marriages? Were you made to rescue children and parents and to get this new thing we're launching, safe families? We need about 30 more people to say, yep, we were made to rescue kids because there are kids that need rescuing in our region. And some people, God made you for that. Don't hold back. Don't think you were made for something else when God made you to rescue kids. Some of us need to be recognized you were made to work for justice, you know. Every time the prophets came up to say you forgot the target, every time a prophet showed up to say you lost sight of the target, one of the things they listed was to work for justice for the oppressed. Maybe you followed the case of this young man, Philando Castile. It's more complicated than I understand, but young guy driving home, broken taillight. We have a recording. He didn't do anything wrong, but the cop got scared, killed him. I don't have the solution to that. But I know the solution will come from the church, from the people of God, deciding we were made to work for justice and peace and healing and reconciliation. You might be the one who does it. The word Micah gave to the people is God's word still for us. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Oh God, protect us. Protect us from the danger that we might succeed while aiming at the wrong target. And redirect our gaze toward a world in need of healing and hope and justice. And empower us to be just those agents of hope in your world. We love you, God. We praise you for how you have blessed us. May, be, may we be conduits of that blessing. For that is why you made us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand together and sing our commitment to let God use us for what he made us for, to bless the whole world. We were made to worship. We were made to love one another. Sing those words with us. excited this morning we get to share in a baptism let's watch together <clears throat> this is my daughter Abigail Grace Hyatt she's accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior and she's ready to be baptized today I can't say anything more than what an honor it is and a blessing on a Father's Day to be a part of this are you ready? Hear it for me. I believe I believe Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. And I accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. You are now baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. Amen. What a great way to end our worship on this wonderful Father's Day. Thank you so much for being here, church. I uh, want to send you out with a happy Father's Day. Hope you've got fun plans for the rest of the day. Tell somebody you love them and make sure that as God has blessed you, you remember to bless the world. If you're interested in a super fun project, we need six or seven people to help us drop those giant walls down, those super giant cross thingies. So if you're, if you're not rushing off to something, I know most of you got to go, but if six or seven people want to stay and help us drop them, That'd be lots of fun. It's pretty cool. Have a great day. Praise God. Bless the world.